going to talk about myself. <clears throat> uh, so Buddhism, of course, makes a, uh, a lot out of no self, or, or more properly, there not being some form of uh, essential unchanging uh, self. And the Heart Sutra, which we'll chant later and chant every week here, uh, of course, talks about the emptiness of, um, of everything, you know, and no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, and all of that. Um, but nonetheless, we have a really clear sense of a, uh, of a self. And so where does this come from? Um, is there some kind of self or not? And this strikes me as a, a matter for observation. It's an empirical problem about it being a, a self rather than some sort of metaphysical uh, problem, something that come through, um, through meditation, uh, observation. And um, so this is going to be participatory uh, tonight. Uh, and so starting off with feeling. So um, hold, hold out your hand. And if you need to, to feel from with, to really feel, you know, move your hand around if you need to. And, and you just feel that, right? Feel the limits of feeling in your hand. And then look, look past your hand, look at some object, you know, it's whether it's the computer or the wall or whatever, and try to feel from within that object, right? You can't, right? I don't feel from within the wall on the other side. I don't feel from within the computer. There's a boundary there um, with my hand, what I feel there. Uh, feel the boundaries of the rest of your body. Um, so if you're sitting, you know, you can feel where, uh, whether it's your, your legs or your knees or your butt or whatever, resting on something, you feel the, the pressure there, or um, you feel look, how cold or hot it is, uh, wherever you, you are. Oh, there's different feelings that, create a, um, a, a, a bounded experience in the world, that all of those feelings direct us to this bounded, uh, this bounded experience or, or self, creating this, this limit through which we go through the world. Um, hearing, so you're listening to my voice right now and it's coming through a computer, um, and listen to you know, where that sound uh, comes from as I'm, as I'm speaking. And, and of course the sound is, is generated in your head because it's not just airwaves or whatever. Um, and, but our minds, they map out sound spatially, right? That they occur, we hear them in a way that we can judge, uh, there are certain distance in a particular direction, right? And so all of those lines of, of distance and direction are pointing back at that bounded being in the world, the thing that's bounded by that sense of feeling beyond which we cannot, uh, feel. Um, and so sound also directs us to that that bounded experience, that the self thing that we um, experience in the world. Seeing it's the same thing, I and mean, you're all looking right now. And uh, again, um, where, where do these sights come from? Of course, they're generated in the mind, but uh, we map them out spatially. Again, see everything we see, it's um, a, a, some distance and direction relative to that bounded, that bounded experience of uh, feeling in the world. Uh, and so everything we see, once again, points us back to that bounded thing, to that self. Smelling, a little weirder than sight or hearing maybe, but um, the same sort of thing. Where do smells come from? They, again, they're generated in the mind, but um, those, I mean, we're not like dogs, so we don't have the same sort of spatial thing with our smell, at least I don't, um, but, you know, I can't smell from within the wall. I can't smell from within the computer. I smell here in my in my nose in relation to that bounded experience in the world. That thing that's bound by the extent of that object I can feel from. Taste, it's the same thing. I taste in my mouth. You know, my mind, of course, is generating what taste is. These aren't necessarily objective things in the world. Um, but again, that the taste occurs relative to that bounded space in the world. It's um, I, I can't, I don't taste from within the wall. I don't taste from within the computer. I taste from my tongue within that object limited by the extent to which I, I can feel. So smell, taste, they point back to that bounded thing. They, they point back to, 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 to self or I. Um, and thoughts too. Remember, you know, in Buddhist psychology, of course, thoughts are the equivalent sort of category to, um, to a smell or, or a taste. Um, and I think appropriately so, just given the, you know, those of us who spend so much time observing thought, I think this makes a lot of sense. Um, 
And so as I'm speaking, you're thinking things, as, you know, you're processing what I'm saying, where do those thoughts come from? Um, and of course they're generated in mind, but even those are mapped spatially. And notice when I'm doing mindfulness of thought meditation, that as thoughts arise, they occur in particular locations in my brain. It's like you can feel where the thoughts are develop, uh, arise in the brain. I mean, it's not that necessarily a discrete point, but in some general area, I'm like, oh, that's kind of coming from the front left, right? So there's a, it's certainly coming. So I experience thoughts in my brain, right? I don't experience them in the wall. I don't experience them in the computer. I don't experience them in, in your head. Uh, and so again, thoughts, as they arise, they point back to that bounded experience. They point back to, to self. Um, so all of these senses, you know, smell, feeling, thinking, all of them point back to, to the self, grounded in that, that bounded felt experience of being in the world. I mean, that's powerful. No wonder we think that there is this clearly defined I in the world, because everything we experience in the world keeps pointing back to that, saying, look, there it is. Every thought, every, everything we feel, everything we see, all of it is pointing back to that, that I that I miss thing. Um, and of course, so who is it then that feels, hears, sees, smells, tastes, what am I missing, thinks? Who is it that's doing all that? You know, is it consciousness? Um, that observer, you know, we've all done enough meditation, you know, there's that, you, know, you recognize that observer function going on in the, in the mind. Um, but even our, our senses and even thinking can occur without that. That attention comes and goes. Of course, we go to sleep, and unless we're dreaming, it disappears um, entirely. But it's remarkable to observe things like a thought occurring, and knowing that it occurs independently of that consciousness of that observer function. And then sometimes you sort of catch it mid-thought, like, oh yeah, there's a, a thought arising that I wasn't even aware of in the first half. So thought and consciousness are not the same thing. Um, they closely related in some ways, but they're they're not the same thing. So that observer function isn't that unchanging um, essential self. It's not that, that I either. It's just one more function, um, like feeling or, or thinking. And so there's nothing special about consciousness. Or, well, no. Consciousness is totally ma magical and mir miraculous, right? But no more than smelling is, which is totally miraculous that, that we smell it. And it's amazing that we do it. But there's nothing extra special about consciousness. So does this mean that there's no self at all? Um, um, or maybe, you know, if there is a self, maybe it's a, a, it's a performance that when we feel or think, what we do is self. So self, uh, this, we, this verb uh, rather than this noun, that it's something that we, maybe something that we do rather than what we are. And as I was doing this sort of um, mindfulness work, uh, Lately, I was struck by the, the four uh, great bodhisattva vows, which took on a new meaning for me. So at least starting with the second one there, uh, delusions are countless. We vow to see through them all. And so every time we um, get some sensation or thought, here's this opportunity to, to sort of see through it. It's this thing that's pointing at I, right? Always reinforcing the sense of self. Um, well, delusions are countless, so are sensations, right? Those are the, the countless delusions. Every time it comes up, here's the chance to see through it all. Opportunities to awaken are infinite. We vow to embrace them all. Again, every single one of those sensations, every time a thought arises and points back to I or self, there's that opportunity to awaken to or true nature, to awaken to, to reality. Um, the Buddha way is endless. Um, there's that constant sensation, that constant thinking that we can deal with, we can observe, we can... Uh, to reckon with. It's endless. The Buddha way is endless. We vow to embody it. Well, we got no choice but to embody, to, to be embodied. We are embodied in the world and that bounded, that thing bounded by that sense of feeling. And so how do we learn to live within that world, live within that, um, live within that self? And of course, I could just be totally wrong about all of this. So, you know, it's all just meditate a lot more, um, observe, so, you know, mindfulness meditation or talk to Andre or read his book about Neti Neti, which is uh, closely related to uh, Vipassana in many ways, but is much more direct and focused on that, um, that sense of I-ness and, and, um, and self. By the way, the, the four great Bodhisattva vows have taken on a new meaning for me and really drill in 
how at really at every moment, this isn't just sort of some Zen cliche thing, but really every moment, everything that pops up really is that that moment of reckoning, that moment of recognizing that that possibility for seeing through the countless delusions to awaken and to embody the um, uh, the way.